Okay, in the class, so today we're going to discuss about the Code of Ethical Conduct for Architects and our brief overview of Republic Act Number 9266. So, for the introduction, we're going to have an overview of Republic Act 9266. I think you, you could remember this one, maybe it was discussed in Proof Proc 1. RE 9266 is the Architecture Act of 2004. So, it establishes a standard for the licensure for the practice of architecture in the Philippines also including the standards uh, for ethical practice for architects also in this country so what's the importance of ethical conduct it's it, that it highlights the role of ethical behavior in ensuring professional integrity and public trust in architectural practice so ethics is really important especially for us professionals and when, when we become architects because if you are an ethical uh, person, uh, it provides more. Uh, it provide it gives the public um, more trust towards not only you but also the profession itself. That's if you behave ethically. So it's really important. Uh, ethical behavior is really important, and we will discuss the details later. Then the objectives of the code defines the code's aim to guide architects in moral, ethical, and legal responsibilities towards society, the environment, and the profession. So, the foundation for the code of the ethical conduct and the architect's role in society and the profession's regulatory framework is Section 7G, Article 2 of Republic Act 9266. So if you look at it, if you're going to look at your, your notes on RE9266 Board Resolution Number 7 Series of 2004 details the implementing rules and regulations of the Architecture Act which further establishes the guidelines for practice. So it's really important uh, plus that we have guidelines for practice in the field of architecture in order to avoid also conflicts uh, with our fellow professionals with our suppliers and with our clients. The role of regulatory bodies is ex explains the oversight and governance provided by the Professional Regulatory Board of Architecture and the Professional Regulation Commission in upholding the code. So, the PRC and the Professional Regulatory, Regulatory Board of Architecture, I think also the UAP, they play uh, they play a certain role as an organization to uphold uh, the code, uh, specifically 9266, and also our Code of Ethics. So what are the traits of architects? So architects are characterized by integrity, responsiveness, business acumen, sensibility, along with artistic and technical abilities. So we could trace this one, guys. The definition of architecture itself, when you say architecture, architecture is the art and science of designing and constructing buildings. So when you say science, it follows scientific principles and guidelines. Artistic also, because it requires creativity as well. Then, it's also important that if you're an architect, that you're also a sensible person. Meaning that you're very easy to deal with and you're a just person. So, if you are someone that, that's hard to handle, then you're going to have a hard time in architecture. And it's also good that you have a business acumen. Business acumen meaning, means that uh, it's not only becoming successful or earning much. Uh, business acumen, I think uh, it, it, it means that you are able to manage your practice properly, that you are able to pay your taxes, you're able to pay uh, your subordinates, your apprentices, you're able to pay the overhead for your office. Then, of course, you're going to have to make a living from practicing as an architect. So, business acumen is also important. Then, responsiveness. So, if you have a project, it's important that you're responsive. If the client has queries, you don't wait for two weeks to reply for an email. Uh, from a client, you try to uh, be res responsive as much as possible to queries because we are here 
to guide the clients into the design that that they want for their house or building. And of course, integrity. So as an architect, you should have a word of honor. It means that it could be trusted. Uh, my new class, integrity is really important in business. And the duties and responsibilities, architects must practice honesty, okay? impartiality, uphold moral responsibilities to associates and subordinates, and carry grave responsibilities towards the public. So it just means, guys, that every line that you do, that you meet when you are designing a building, you should think about it. Especially when you're designing hospitals or, uh, or pub buildings that the public use. That you should have uh, um, that sense of responsibility on how heavy your responsibility is because one mistake in your planning and then it could cost the life of the public. The public. Okay. Of course, you also have moral responsibilities to associates and subordinates as well. It doesn't mean that you are the boss, that you should just do uh, what you want without thinking of the consequences. You have Article 2, responsibilities in relation to the people, what we call the civic responsibilities. So architects have civic duties towards the public, including respecting and contributing to the societal fabric. Okay? So architects, guys, we should observe when we design, we should observe the behavior of the public when we are designing our, our buildings. Then our designs, it should respect and contribute to the fabric of society. So it's, it should not just be something that is done for artistic value alone, but it should be considered that the buildings that you design should have considerations for the people that will be living in it as well. And we have respect for heritage. So upholding respect for natural, historic, and cultural heritage in all projects. So, for example, somebody approaches you to this to to demolish a house so that the client can build a, a commercial uh, district, a commercial area. But upon research, you know, um, you found out that the house has been there for more than two centuries or, or so. So you have the responsibility to inform your client that there is a historical significance for the building that is about to be demolished. Now, that's why when you design, uh, for example, if you design something, you should consider the history and, and culture of the occupants or users of the building. Then professional exchange, promoting professional organization and technical exchange to foster community growth and learning. Then compliance and competence, Ensuring compliance with laws, regulations, and ethical standards while maintaining and promoting professional competence. That's why, class, you, we have professional practice 1 to 4 as your subjects so that you'll know all the different laws and regulations and ethical standards. So when you look at the other professions, they don't have professional practice subjects, so you are lucky to have a prof-prac subject. So I hope that you won't take this subject for granted. Because aside from your technical competence, you must make sure that the buildings that you design or implement are compliant. Not, uh, not with the building code, with BP344, with the uh, fire code, and also RA9266. Okay, next slide. Article 3. Good faith and obligation. So maintaining... So this is the relations, uh, responsibilities in relation to the client. Of course, this is your responsibility as an architect. So good faith and obligations. So maintaining good faith and upholding moral obligations towards clients throughout the project's life cycle. Then professional services and fees. Delivering professional services efficiently and transparently with clear communication about fees. Now, if you're a new architect, 
you might feel somewhat um, shy when you are talking about your fees. But this is something that you really must discuss with your clients before you start with the project so that the client will not be surprised with your billing. So <clears throat> it is your obligation to discuss with your client beforehand before you start. Okay. You should educate the client on what the architect's role is in the project. In the client's interest and welfare, balancing client's interest with public welfare, ensuring ethical considerations in all decisions. So when you design something, it should, it should not be solely about the client's interest, but you should also look at the welfare of the public as well. So that is your duty as the architect. Okay? should ensure ethical considerations in all the decisions that you're going to make. should put in your into your mind that um, what you have is a privilege that is granted by the state to, save, to safeguard the interest also of the public, if not just your client. So fee and business relations, managing professional fees and business relations with fairness and integrity. Okay? One thing to interpret this is that there when you when you design something okay um you should make sure that you're going to get paid for it even if you will be the one who will do the construction work because if you don't uh seek for a fee for a design fee it might hurt those architects who are just into design only okay you should be fair so that our profession will survive no matter what. I think there are enough projects for everyone. The problem is just with greed. Okay. So what are the responsibilities in regards to the contractor? Of course, it is fair safeguarding of the contractor's interest. So it means that you should just, just be fair with the contractor and not just unnecessarily burden him. Okay. If the contractor it deserves to be paid on time and, if, and he finishes a portion of work in accordance with the desired quality, then he should advise the client that he should get paid already. So you should also safeguard also the contractor because he's paying as well for, uh, for, for his workers and the engineers that he has on site. Then clarity and accuracy in the contract documents. It just means that in your designs, the details should be clear. There should be no room for other interpretation so that the contractor could easily implement the project. Okay. And of course, the rejection of non-conforming work. If the work of the contractor is, does not conform to the standards, the construction standards that is agreed upon, then you should reject that. Okay. Because by rejecting it, you'd also be helping the contractor um, avoid further problems in the future. Then professional independence from contractors and subcontractors. So it is advised that when you are the architect and you represent the client, that you're independent from the contractors and subcontractors so that you'll be impartial and you safeguard the interest of your client and the public in all your decisions. Okay, so that's our ethical responsibility to the contractor. Then responsibilities in relation to manufacturers, dealers, and agents, of course, the technical information exchange, for example, if they have a new product and then you're going to try it, maybe you observe something that they have not yet found out in their laboratories or um, uh, what not what not so you try to inform them uh, of about their product then the avoidance of conflicts of interest so there should be no conflict of interest between you the manufacturers dealers and agents and how do you how do you avoid that is that you avoid uh, getting monetary uh, getting monetary um, rewards from them. Then the credit of market discounts to the client. So if there are market discounts, you should try to credit them to the client so that the client can save as well. So that's your ethical responsibility. 
the manufacturers, dealers, and agents. We have Article 6, Responsibilities in Relation to Colleagues and Subordinates. First, Professional Service Fees and Agreements. So why is this a responsibility to colleagues and subordinates? If you have professional service agreements and fees, it would ensure that you are getting paid for your design. And it means that architects only engage in design only services will not suffer in the future. Because if you don't charge for your design, you only and you hide that in the uh, construction just to get the project, those who do the design work only will suffer. Their firm firms will suffer and the future of the profession will suffer. So that's something you should think about. Everything that you do, there should be professional service agreements with the corresponding fees. Then participation in competitions. So I'm not someone who joins competitions, but participation in competitions, I think it also uh, improves your relations uh, as a team inside your firm because uh, it unites you to a common goal. Then professional courtesy and mentorship. So it means that you should try to be uh, courteous to your fellow architects. And when it comes to your subordinates or apprentices, you should mentor them and not withhold information so that they could grow as well. So remember guys that our time on this planet is only limited. Okay. What, what, li what we live here in this earth is our legacy. So we shouldn't withhold information. We should try to allow our apprentices to grow and become successful architects also. Then promotion of the profession in advocacy work. Of course, you should promote the practice of the profession. Okay. In advocacy work, you could also work with, I don't know, if you have an advocacy, for example, that you do designs for the indigenous people or the, those who are less in life and try to help them for your designs, you could do that also. Okay, so I think that's the end of my presentation. So thank you for listening, guys. I think uh, I'll post our activity on the um, Padlet link. But I'll just inform you here as well that your activity would be to Record your record yourself reciting the architect's credo. Okay, don't need to memorize. I just want to, you to internalize the importance of ethics, because guys, I'll tell you frankly, ethics is the glue that binds professional practice one to four. Without it, you're not a professional. Okay. So see you next meeting and uh, have a nice day ahead, class.